Hi, uh, I'm Bob Sorensen. I'm, I'm, I'm with IDC, and I have the extreme pleasure of being a moderator today for a panel that I've been really looking forward to. Um, on uh, August 29th, uh, the White House it issued... July 29th. July 29th. I actually wrote July 29th. You're right. On July 29th, the White House ex uh, issued an executive order establishing the National Strategic Computing Initiative, which had some very broad and strategic strategic and ambitious goals. And, and some of the phrases that I call from it is, is, is words like enduring and 15-year time frame and long-term and collaboration and, and cooperation and advancing technology. It's, it's a very strategic and very aggressive uh, set of initiatives. Um, you could, if you download the fact sheet, uh, you, you get a sense of some of the tactical issues that are interested merging ex exaflop with exascale data, um, new technologies that will bring us past Moore's law. But if you look at some of the guiding principles, there are phrases in there that talk about fostering scientific discovery. And, and the one that I'm particularly interested in, which is basically broadly fostering economic uh, competitiveness through collaboration with government, industry, uh, and academia. Um, so there's lots and lots of questions about how this program is going to go forward. Uh, what are some of the particulars? What are the emphasis? What are the details? And, and more importantly, how does one measure success as one moves forward here? What are some of the, the ways that, that, that people can tell that things are, are moving in a positive direction? So with that, what we've assembled here this morning are some of the folks that were instrumental uh, in, in thinking about this executive order, not from July 29th, but going back in some cases almost two years. Uh, meeting quite frequently and having lots and lots of interesting discussions about what some of the important issues in HPC were. So for the first part of this morning's session, we have some of the folks that are really on the front lines of, of this executive order, and, and each of them are going to share uh, some of their unique perspectives uh, on where this goes. And then later on in the morning, we're going to have a more open forum with a, hopefully a robust question and answer session where we're going to have folks from a number of the agencies who are, for lack of a better term, are pretty much on the hook uh, to make this thing work. And, and hopefully what we'll get from those folks is a, a little bit of perspective. I like to think of it as the, taking the derivative of the NSCI with respect to their respective agencies and, and get a sense of how this thing is going to start to roll out uh, in, in a more tactical and practical sense. And I'd like to think that there's a number of folks here in the room that are not directly familiar with this initiative, but are certainly interested in, in the role that industry and academia can play in supporting this really important project as it goes forward. Because one thing is, is, is very clear as far as I'm concerned. This is not an initiative of an administration uh, that, that will end if an, that administration moves on. Uh, this is something that hopefully will be with us for a long time and will we'll have a real chance of redirecting the course of high performance computing development uh, for the United States writ large. So as I said, this is something that I think we'll be talking about hopefully for a long period of time. So just to, to quickly introduce the panel here, we're going to start off with, with Randy Bryan, who's from OSTP, uh, Irene Qualters from, is from the NSF, Will Coella is from DOD, who, who, and I think a wonderful piece of serendipity, also not only being DOD, spent a couple years up on the hill, so he probably knows much more about how the sausage is made than any of us really care to know, but, but I, I think we'll get some interesting uh, insights. And, and finally, we're going to have Doug Koth uh, from Oak Ridge uh, supply some, some insights as well. So if we'll just, Randy, if you want to just, just start off, go right ahead. Okay. So um, just by way of background, this is an activity that's been going on for quite a while. And a lot of the stimulus for it came from the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology, who have written several reports over the years saying there doesn't seem to be any kind of coordinated activity in high performance computing on the federal government and we see major uh, roadblocks ahead for HPC that really call for uh, activity by the federal government so get going. And uh, so that culminated then and was mentioned in an executive order that was signed on um, July 29th and you have seen parts of this but as it says, it's trying to create a, um, an initiative focused on research in HPC that will be not only across the whole federal government, but also involve uh, collaboration with industry and academia. And the purpose of it is scientific discovery, so the research that historically has been done using high performance computing as well as economic competitiveness, which is uh, government speak for promoting successful industry and commercial development. 
And then uh, the EO contains uh, five strategic objectives that I think uh, some of you have already seen. But uh, in my own, uh, the way I like to present it, I like to sort of adjust these and adapt these a little bit to talk about a set of themes that map to the strategic objectives, but uh, do them in a slightly different order and a little bit different grouping, and focus more on what outcomes we want um, in the long run. So what I'm going to do is just briefly go through these five themes and uh, talk about them. So the first is this idea, and I heard it quite a bit yesterday in people's discussion of sort of combining the traditional numerical modeling and simulation of high performance computing with uh, data analytics. And uh, in my mind, that's a pretty big uh, bridge to, a gap to bridge. <laughs> Uh, in that if I look at sort of the largest systems out there, you sort of look inside these systems, not just the hardware, but even the operating systems, the runtime systems, how they're programmed, uh, sort of the, the whole philosophy of how they're uh, built and operated are fairly different. And I think it will be interesting and a challenge to see how we reach a convergence between these two. And so I think that's a long-term goal that, that will be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, the next is, of course, what's gotten the most press is sort of the, in the, the focus on uh, exascale and the desire to sort of uh, move the U.S. ahead. And, of course, a lot of the question becomes, so who really is ahead these days? <laughs> and I think the, the thing that I've come to appreciate and uh, a lot of people here also know that, you know, there's much more to a machine than how it runs on one particular benchmark. And then the, the sort of second uh, corollary I'd say to that is, and there's much more to a, a capacity of, of HPC than what the best machine in the country is able to do. And so you think about what we're really going for is not just one machine that will crack some benchmark that will make people feel uh, good, but also that will build up the nation's capacity to have machines of different classes available and are actually being put to use for these goals of scientific discovery and economic competitiveness. So it's a much broader thing than just uh, you know, a stunt of, of uh, trying to race to the top. Uh, and of course, you've heard about the Department of Energy's Exascale program, and that's sort of the cornerstone of this aspect of the operation, is making sure that that program is successful. Um, another area that I think is particularly in needing a focus is the challenge of, of programming, the software development challenges for HPC. And I think people understand that, if anything, we're moving backward, not forward in this area. And in particular, the introduction of GPUs into supercomputers has meant now, really, we have to program at multiple levels of these machines. And uh, so smart people doing heroic effort can make things run fast on these machines, and then three years later they buy a new machine and they have to rewrite large parts of the code and migrate things up and down this uh, stack where the programming models at these different levels of it are fairly different. And so there's a lot of recoding of existing code going on. And if you think about that for a, a small company that wants to make use of HPC to model their... Um, you know, the, the wind uh, flowing over their bicycle frames or something like that, it's a pretty big step to be able to imagine them getting on board with HPC resources and making good use of them. So, you know, what you'd really like to say, think of is that the whole programming is moved up several layers of abstraction to be uh, somewhat more platform independent. And then there's various techniques and tools that would let you move and, and get efficient application, uh, efficient operation on an HPC resource through various different mechanisms. And I think especially for the federal government, this is the kind of thing it can do well is the investment in fundamental research that will lead toward these kind of goals. Um, the third, the other part is again this issue of access. And as I said, not just access for the big players, the large companies, that can afford to uh, buy their own hardware and operate them and have the expertise, or the uh, you know, scientific researchers who've been doing this for a long time, but uh, 
all across the board, getting more people involved and more access. And that includes both physical access to the resources, but also the expertise of knowing how to use them, not just from a software developer's perspective, but also an application user, understanding modeling and simulation and data analytics well enough to be able to use it effectively in whatever problems they're trying to solve. And I think especially if you look at our current models of how people get access to systems, they either buy them or there's very limited opportunities to rent or get access to existing uh, machines. But clearly we need a, a much more robust marketplace and whether it's a cloud as we think of it now or some extension of that that is more suitable for HPC usage, I think that in the long term we have to have a, a vital commercial uh, basis for this that will be uh, successful and, and sustaining. But I think there's a need for a lot of creative thinking in that area. And the final, and this often gets dropped off the bottom, but in my way, feeling this is one, again, where the federal government has a very important role, which is what the heck are we going to do when Silicon CMOS comes to its end? <coughs> and uh, I think most of us are in the denial phase of the uh, you know, three phases of grief here. Uh, but the, um, the reality is that uh, after some limit, it's going to happen. Uh, there's just only so many uh, molecules you can assemble together. You know, you, you need at least some number of them to call it a transistor. And um, that era is actually coming in the, a time frame that it's enough, soon enough, that we better be uh, more concerted in our effort. In particular, you know, there's a lot of very interesting research going on in scattered pockets in different forms about what could future technology be. Will it be some variation on CMOS? Will it use carbon nanotubes? Will it shift over to quantum computing or involve cryogenic operation? Or, you know, totally new models of computation, neuromorphic uh, computation and so forth. But the reality is none of these are anywhere near ready for taking over the the sort of bulk of computing that we do today. They're, they're way far from commercial uh, sustainability and large-scale use. So this is the time when we really need to be getting uh, working on that. And the implications for this aren't just for the device builders and the hardware uh, people, but all the layers of computing that will be built on top of these new systems as well uh, could have effect on computer architecture, uh, programming models, software development, and so forth. And this clearly is, again, an area where the federal government is the best place to invest in pre-competitive, very fundamental long-term research. And so the, the government has a unique role in, in sustaining this kind of activity. So Bob, you were like my front man here. You said, well, what would success look like for the NSCI? And so I just sort of uh, say for these themes, but if you could imagine 10 years from now, we could look back and say, yes, we got things going, and look at how much progress we've made, and uh, we have a map that will take us into the future. And it would involve sort of advancing on all five of these themes in some way that we could see that uh, we really have gained something by having had this initiative. Uh, a final statement is, as you saw in the executive order, there's um, multiple federal agencies involved in this. Three of them are considered lead agencies, sort of driving the main activities. And they happen to be the three agencies uh, that are here today, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Energy. Uh, there's other agencies that will uh, be uh, sponsoring research activities. I should mention, obviously, the lead agencies will be very involved in research as well. And then there's a series of agencies that are considered deployment agencies, meaning they're cooperating, participating, uh, especially in sort of specking out and thinking about future applications and future uh, systems and how they'll be used, but they're not considered sort of in the driver's seat of the um, overall initiative. So that's it for me. Morning, everyone, and um, uh, thanks for uh, the HPC user folks for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be back, and I haven't seen many of you in quite a while, but I, as I look across the audience, I probably <laughs> know 25 to 50 percent of the people here. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so Randy gave a great introduction and a 
uh, perspective on the initiative. And I'm going to focus a little bit more. I'll skip the overview slides. I wasn't sure exactly um, where he was going to start. And I'll just give a more narrow uh, view on NSF and how it sees its role and where its focus is. Um, and so uh, Randy uh, covered this. He, he mentioned that, um, that there are three lead agencies and uh, uh, with DOD and DOE, uh, NSF's role particularly is called out for scientific discovery advances, the broader HPC ecosystem, and for workforce development. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about what's motivating us in those dimensions. And, um, and I, I will uh, readily admit there, uh, this is very much early stage, so it's good to have this presentation now. And I'm very interested in uh, this group's uh, uh, discussion and questions about how we might approach some of the objectives that I'm not touching on. So uh, again, uh, Randy went through this, and I'll not spend time. Randy also talked about the objectives, and I wanted to focus on objectives two, three, and four. Um, the, the press release is all focused on um, objective one, uh, uh, but for NSF, uh, the resonance for two, three, and four, while we're interested in all the objectives, the resonance for two, three, and four is particularly strong. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And I also wanted to say that uh, for number five, um, uh, that we were very early stages and nascent. So I, I really am interested in discussions from the groups here on uh, how best we, um, as many agencies, and particularly as NSF, should approach it. So also a little bit on next steps, what's going on now. Um, we, there is an executive council that was mandated as part of the executive order um, with memberships from all the participating agencies and it's, it's co-chaired by OSTP and OMB. Uh, and we're in the first phase of an implementation plan that was also mandated and it, the clock started July 29th, so 90 days later we have to have our first implementation plan. So we're working on that now. Um, so I'm just going to go deep into number three um, and say these, this is, this is, these are the kinds of activities, the uh, areas within NSF. So I want to start and say, first of all, this isn't an IT initiative <laughs> in NSF. This is a science, advancing science initiative. So uh, I don't, uh, the objective three, which uh, is really uh, a critical strategic issue for the nation and is involving other agencies, and in particular on this one, IARPA and uh, NIST are prominent. But in the NSF world, uh, engineering uh, directorate, the computer information and science and engineering directorate, uh, the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate and the Bio Directorates are intimately involved and I would say the first three are right now most active in looking at the post-wars law. And as Randy indicated, this isn't just uh, a hardware uh, effort, it's also uh, rethinking the software activities. And this isn't a, an exhaustive list as, as I look here. Certainly the machine learning piece is really, uh, uh, should definitely be on this list. But um, this is an activity that I, I certainly see um, industry and academic engagement is, there's already a baseline for that. Uh, and so really trying to really lift that and really um, make it go faster and more profoundly is, is the goal. And I think there's a good basis for this one. Um, I want to talk a little bit, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but uh, increasing that coherence, just stepping back a little bit and looking at it from the science perspective, um, 
The world of modeling and simulation, and I've used data science in place of data analytics, um, and have uh, given examples where uh, science really cannot advance unless we make progress. And data simulation turns out that it's in many disciplines is a rate limiting um, uh, uh, activity. Uh, visualization, image analysis, there was just uh, uh, last week the uh, president was uh, in uh, Alaska uh, as part of the U.S. Uh, uh, chairmanship of the Arctic Council for the next two years and one of the activities they talked about is uh, doing a high resolution uh, map of the entire Arctic and that's a huge image analysis program um, and uh, they've, they've just started I think the University of Illinois was uh, kind enough to get them started um, uh, by providing some time on blue waters to do this mapping. But the issue is that there are many images of the Arctic and many interests in the Arctic. Uh, but the images are all at different resolutions. And so uh, trying to get a, a really first high resolution map is a non-trivial activity. And you could imagine that um, that uh, that is, uh, that the systems we're using to do that are not necessarily thought, uh, were not necessarily designed or conceived to optimize for image analysis. But we can also see that in areas such as understanding the brain, which is a very significant initiative in, uh, uh, in other areas of geo, uh, as, as well as looking at cosmology. This is a really critical um, um, uh, function to be able to uh, uh, work well in in order to advance science. So data compression uh, as the large instruments, we need new algorithms, we need appro new approaches for uh, compression. Um, uh, certainly the, the visualization uh, uh, particularly in the real-time arena is also urgent. So trying to marry the capabilities of modeling and simulation often in a dynamic, not necessarily real-time, but in a dynamic workflow with the data science attributes um, is something that has profound science uh, implications and will be an area of focus for us. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that when I think of data science, and I'm going to uh, credit Doug for um, suggesting uh, a particular book uh, that I used um, uh, and reworked a little bit one of the images. This is a 2010 Drew Conway uh, image of data science. And uh, this resonates uh, within the NSF community in that data science is emerging and it's inherently disciplinary, interdisciplinary. So its pedagogical home is really unclear. Um, but you need all the elements. You need the foundational underpinnings in statistics and mathematics. You need the domain knowledge to know which questions are relevant to ask and are important enough to ask. And you need the technical skills, the engineering practice to know what actually can be done. So um, again, I think this plays into not only uh, the, the second objective, but also learning and workforce development in a very serious way. And I'm going to credit Randy with this slide, uh, just picking off, uh, taking off from what he mentioned in his presentation. The goal of this initiative is to move the state of the art, not just merge and combine, but really uh, uh, take the nation forward in both dimensions. Um, on, a, on a, uh, a platform that has shared uh, technology. So we also see a profound uh, uh, alliance between uh, objective two and four, which is increasing the capacity and capability. And uh, this is an, uh, these activities are, um, we have an internal working group that I'll talk about. Uh, all directorates are participating in uh, in plans in this area, and uh, and uh, 
there's a good deal of excitement and I want to again reference that for us this is not just about technology or systems. The people on the software, um, and the software in particular, I think we see this as a critical opportunity um, to uh, reinvent the software architecture and the software base for, uh, for the future. So um, I'm a little bit uh, running out of time. Um, I guess only one thing I'll say here. Uh, the conduct of science is changing, and it's, it's not just science. Uh, everybody's uh, the, uh, uh, interaction with uh, technology is profoundly changing the way everyone works and, e and even how our lives, and science is no different. And so I think uh, examining this activity in that bigger context um, uh, is, is really, um, I think, profound and uh, strategic. And I think we can look at it from the science side. I think the role of industry and how the broader industry and how the nation's competitiveness can be enhanced, um, I think we, we're really looking for a way to start that dialogue. Um, and then uh, I think I'll just close so I don't take too much time. Um, Right now, uh, our implementation um, is on that more on that second wide bullet. We've uh, this is being um, this activity is being governed uh, at the uh, highest level within NSF, the heads of directorates. We have a cross directorate working group that's uh, working on the initial planning. It's being jointly led by SIZE and the Math and Physical Sciences Directorate. Um, we also are uh, establishing uh, uh, vehicles for community input, and those will certainly be through our advisory committees, which are public uh, groups, and uh, it will probably be through multiple advisory committees, uh, certainly the cyber infrastructure one, but uh, uh, we expect other directorate advisory committees. And we also have a National Academy study that was looking at the future for advanced computing infrastructure. That uh, final report is due in October, so that's extremely timely. So this is really for us coming together in a way that uh, it's really set up to have high impact. And so uh, this is the beginning and we hope that you'll engage and let us know how best um, we should uh, include industry and should include the um, academic community. And I also want to acknowledge that there are, the Council of Competitiveness has been looking at software and workforce development and I think uh, some of the um, work that that group has done will most certainly inform uh, the approaches we take, but we're looking to evolve it. So that's it. I am here uh, with the blessing of Steve Binkley. Uh, he is the Associate Director of the DOE Office of Science Advanced Computing Research uh, Program Office, or OSCAR as we call it, and also uh, Tuck Hong and Doug Wade in the NNSA Advanced Simulation and Computing Program. Some of my DOE lab colleagues, uh, I think I may be up here for the next panel as well, uh, can, uh, can correct me or uh, dive in deeper. Um, what I'm showing now is just a few slides that uh, Steve Binkley showed at his advisory committee meeting in July. And so uh, it's, it's known as ASCAC for the, uh, Oscar, uh, the Oscar Advisory Committee. You can find this presentation online. I'm just going to show a few slides from his presentation. Also a nice presentation from Dan Reed, a subcommittee of ASCAC that gave some, uh, some very good recommendations to the Department of Energy, in this case the Oscar Program Office, on, uh, on how to proceed with the Exascale uh, Computing Initiative. So the, uh, the DOE role uh, is being embodied within one project known as the Exascale Computing Initiative, or ECI. And, that has, uh, and this is a project with, uh, with a capital P, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, I'll also point out that um, 
Um, the exascale research and funding in the DOE has been ongoing for, for many years, in fact. And so this is essentially not a new start, but it is in that it's being projectized, okay? And in, um, in, in DOE land, that means or, uh, we're following a fairly rigorous process known as uh, 413. And that's a, uh, historically, that's a, a project, project, uh, project process for large capital acquisition. So this particular initiative, ECI, as we're calling it, is a 10-year project, uh, formally starting October 1, okay? And it, do, it does have, as part of it, uh, capital acquisitions, namely two or more capable exascale systems. In fact, I'll back up a little, little bit with regard to NSCI. Um, DOE, uh, the, at least the way, the way I see it, this is Doug speaking now, uh, can and will contribute to all, all, the, all the NSCI objectives. The one that it is most on point for is delivering the, the capable, uh, capable exascale systems. And, and my role, which I'll get into maybe in the next panel a little bit more, is more on the application side, and I'm using the term application for, for uh, large simulation codes, uh, is really, uh, the way I see it, it's the DOE needs to and will deliver breakthrough science, energy, and national security applications that are capable of exploiting these exascale systems to deliver new, new insights and, and solutions. So uh, I'll, I'll now go to this slide, and I think I just have one more. Things have changed uh, a little bit. But um, the ECI uh, is, is DOE's implementation uh, of the NSCI. So the ECI is a project that uh, will be executed um, by the DOE lab uh, personnel. And you see in Steve's slide uh, here, there are 17 DOE labs and all will, will play a role. Uh, these six are most likely to play uh, uh, leadership roles. Although, uh, I mean, uh, for, from what I know of my colleagues across the DOE lab complex, there are lots of very talented people who uh, have uh, been deeply embedded into HPC. And uh, we, we're essentially looking for, uh, we're essentially right now assembling a leadership team for the, for the ECI. You see the six labs that, that are listed, three NSA labs and uh, Oak Ridge, uh, Argonne and uh, in actually Berkeley have been uh, more involved recently with with Steve and uh, and took uh, in formulating the initial plans. Okay, the uh, so I am I am here in part because the project office will reside at Oak Ridge, and in that sense, uh, Oak Ridge will carry uh, a lead responsibility and a lead role in executing the project. Uh, that does not mean that all Oak Ridge personnel will lead this project. It is a very complicated project, and we need essentially the best and brightest across the DOE lab system. But uh, we are in the, in the process of establishing a project office and uh, putting together uh, a leadership team. And I'll say we as the DOE. And so um, I've been engaged with this group uh, for about four months now. And in terms of a 413 project process, um, it's, uh, it's onerous. But uh, there are lots of good reasons to do this. Um, we're viewing this as a very complicated, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary uh, project. And so because of that, we're going to follow a fair amount of rigor. And in this case, we're going to go through, if you're familiar with this process, uh, uh, great, maybe you can enlighten me a little bit more. But we're going to go through several critical decisions. And the, the, right now, we're in the process of what's called CD0, which is to get formal mission need approved. And uh, uh, this comes with. Uh, some uh, important documents and presentations and, and critical reviews by federal personnel. And so right now we're in the process of, uh, of seeking CD0 or mission need approval. The next step would be CD1, critical decision one, which, is, which essentially gets into the acquisition strategy, the alternatives analysis, and uh, essentially having what's equivalent to a baseline uh, project plan. So you can see in Steve's slide there, that uh, we, uh, DOE lab personnel working with the Oscar program office and the ASC office have put together uh, a, essentially a project structure. And I think if, if you look at the structure, you can get a sense of, of the scope of the project and, and what we're endeavoring to, uh, to undertake uh, with regard to uh, the kind of the breadth and depth of, of the R&D. So uh, my role currently is uh, lead for the applications development portion of the ECI. Okay, so you see the work break breakdown structure and uh, having had lar a lot of experience with large projects and programs, I can tell you that this, this structure will likely change, okay? So uh, it will likely change as we learn more and we, and we, we, we uh, begin to execute. But um, 
there, uh, let me just point out kind of the four main technical areas. Application development, uh, which is uh, my role, uh, is going to uh, emit, um, we, we believe, uh, dozens of applications that will be exascale ready. And um, the traditional, uh, the tr what I'll call the, the traditional applications are certainly in scope. Uh, if you ask, uh, is there one, one killer app, I would say no. There's probably dozens uh, from what we can see. Uh, historically, your, your three killer apps, as, as, at least as I would see it, would be those in support of the, uh, the, uh, the stockpile, would be those in support of crypto analytics. And uh, being a, a nuclear engineer, I would argue that nuclear reactors have been a killer app really since the 40s. They, they have been, will be, are, and will be. But we see dozens of other, uh, other uh, applications. And I think I'll, I'll reserve the next panel session to dive into to the application space in a little bit more detail. But um, the interesting thing about this project is uh, we, uh, we're on the application side, we're looking at uh, uh, the applied energy offices in, in, in the Department of Energy as well as the, uh, the Office of Science and also reaching out to uh, potentially uh, other, other, other federal agencies in terms of uh, a shared fate uh, formal engagement. And in particular, um, in, it, you know, I think it was noted by, by Randy and Irene, obviously there are, there are, there's lots of synergies and, and uh, reasons to collaborate with, uh, with NSF but uh, also with NIH and potentially NOAA and NASA. Um, so, um, I think in the interest of time, I, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of these elements until and unless you, you have questions. Uh, let me just um, uh, say one, a little bit more about applications and then, and then conclude. Um, on the application side, um, a um, RFI was submitted by the Department of Energy to all the DOE labs uh, early June for white papers uh, from DOE lab personnel uh, with regard to their ideas and thinkings uh, uh, about what applications uh, can be, should be developed, what's their, what's their decadal problem, what's the impact urgency, what are the challenges. Uh, those white papers, we received about 130 of them uh, from 12 of the 17 DOE labs, and they're, they're still coming in. Um, a, uh, another RFI, I believe, is due to go out this week to other agencies, I think in particular uh, NSF and uh, NIH. So we're currently gathering information to, to help sort of formulate and influence our, our plans and our scope. Uh, so on the application side, I do encourage you to, uh, if not contact me, you can contact one of the program offices and uh, you know, it, it's never too late to, to get your good ideas uh, with regard to um, the Exascale application side. And again, uh, there's a software technology piece and you can see all the elements of the software technology piece. Hardware technology piece that uh, you know, really is, a, is carrying on uh, the fast forward and design forward sorts of activities with the vendors. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of scope uh, and resources available for, uh, for those activities in hardware technology. And Exascale Systems will essentially deploy two or more diverse systems within the next uh, 10 years. Nominally 2023, but uh, don't hold me to that. We'll have to see uh, what happens. But uh, this project expect to run through, is, exp is, is expected to run through uh, 2025. So with that said, I will, uh, I'll, I'll conclude for now and be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. The lead agency represent, representative working with Irene, our partners at DOE and OSTP, etc., to develop that implementation plan. Um, she was, you know, that 90 day clock started on the 29th of July. Our first draft is due, uh, what, 10 days, Irene? So we're cranking forward pretty heavily on that. Um, so uh, a little bit of background on, on me I'm, I'm actually from NSA. We are the executive agent for DOD in its capacity as the uh, lead agency for the NSCI. And we can talk a little bit about why, why NSA versus some of the other th aspects. And certainly DOD has a large role across the board, um, uh, both within our agency, but also with the HPC mod program, which you're familiar with. So I think the best description for us uh, is why NSA has got a role in this NSCI should come as no surprise. We have um, you know, 
significant investment in the HPC field. And across all objectives, really, we have some uh, degree of at least a, a modicum of interest in, in making sure that they're successful. The, um, I guess the best description, and I'll go a little bit more into detail on the objectives, but the best description of our role, I think, is going to be one of an advocate for the requirements process. When you look across the board, um, you know, we're ensuring that the national security community in particular, but in general, um, those deployment agencies that don't necessarily have the big budgets or the big deployment requirements uh, are going to be incorporated. So whether you're talking about uh, law enforcement, obviously the intelligence community, the military community, those requirements will be incorporated, uh, particularly on the data analytics side. DOD has got a large uh, mission requirements in that space. Um, we also are uh, kind of the lead development and deployment agency for objective three. Obviously, once that starts coming online, right now that's more of we're certainly you know we're starting much farther behind compared to the exascale uh, parts in the sense that we are really in the assessment phase of where we should even be investing in the first place. The investment across the board is very diffuse. There's a lot of promise, but there's also a lot of risk and. Um, I think one of, the, one of the common characteristics is that there's still a lot of miracles of science that need to occur for every one of those particular pathways before we could even con contemplate a, uh, you know, mission-capable devices in any of those systems. So we've, um, but we've got a long history of being on the, on the front end of that, so it made natural sense for us being a sense of that nexus of national security. Um, uh, bleeding edge uh, research and development in terms of HPC, uh, unique systems, etc. So that's really where we fit in. Um, and, and to be fair, we also, you know, I, I'm working across DOD, uh, making sure that the requirements parts for HPC mod, certainly on the mod sim side, they've got a lot of interest in the exascale piece, and we'll be working with DOE to make sure that those requirements are put in. But also, I, I think this is starting to get into the implementation side, the role of the lead agencies. A lot of the NSCI at the, at the implementation level is going to be about essentially investment portfolio management, right? So we're looking across the board of can we get more than one spin on for the same dime across the community, and which is traditionally with uh, the federal government. We, uh, we're notorious for not talking to each other. It should come as no surprise. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we can actually align our investments. And for us, what that means particularly for NSA and what we are looking to kind of set as the model is, you know, we're going to open up our kimono to, the, to, the, to DOE and to, to kind of the other NSF and folks like that and say, here's where we're working. These are the folks, these are the areas of focus that we have. And um, what are you investing in? What are we investing in? Can we align and, and synergize those investments across the board? That's, I think, the early phases of the NSCI um, implementation plan is going to be focused on that. What are we doing, doing an assessment across the board of where we're spending our money now, and then um, do the best, because FY16 is going to be more focused on, um, certainly just, it's already set. We're starting in 20 days. The budgets are set. We're going to try to focus as best we can within our own agency budgets and start aligning with the goal of doing, um, I think, some you know, influencing FY17 budget as best we can, but really focusing on FY18 for the area where we'll start getting a, a big influx in, in terms of addressing gaps, right? So, um, again, because we're on that two-year budget cycle, FY18, really that submission is going to be next spring, so we don't have a lot of time to look across the board, especially for Objective 3. So. We're going to be very busy. I think part of, uh, you know, Irene and I, we've got our, we're digging out our cat herding chaps. Uh, we're going to get that going. Uh, if you've ever dealt in the interagency, I had a little bit of background on myself, like Rob mentioned. I actually came from the Hill. I was a professional staffer on the Intelligence Committee before I went up to NSA. So I've had um, plenty of experience on the inside of seeing how the sausage is made and, and uh, just how bad we can be. Um, and we're trying to avoid that. I think. I, as, just as a commentary on um, as more of a latecomer to the NSCI, we feel it's very important, uh, obviously, I think you all, we share your enthusiasm for it, and it's, I just have to say, it's one of the more elegantly put together and well-founded um, initiatives I, that I've seen coming out of the government. Uh, there was a lot of work that, that didn't get necessarily put within the, the seven pages of the executive order that really lay the foundation for the economic advantage, the national security advantages, the scientific discovery that we're really excited about.
So um, just to go into a little bit of detail where we think our roles are going to fit within the particular objectives, obviously for we're going to work support DOE's effort there taking the lead on objective one and delivering that exascale system. We're going to make sure that the HPC mod programs and the rest of the community, especially the mod sim and the scientific community, can get those requirements in and where we're making investments actually help accelerate the program. That would be uh, a goal I think you can see. To do a little bit of a divide and conquer, which is going to make Doug's um, project management job a little bit more complicated, but, but we're going to try to help where we can. Um, objective two is one where we, I, I think, uh, is certainly an area where we're going to take a, a balanced role um, in between us, NSF, and DOE. I, you know, uh, bringing up the data analytics side, as you can imagine, is, is that's an area of huge importance for us right now. We have always traditionally been in a more the more specialized end of, of uh, high performance computing. But HPDA is a growing area for us. And in particular, getting that, making sure that the data analytics side for IC problems, for NSA's problems, for the military and, and, and law enforcement community, there's tons of applications out there that we need to make sure that it's getting incorporated. But we also have um, ecosystem issues, right? How do we, for us, we, um, our high performance computing missions are increasingly taking place in the more open intelligence analyst production environment and so those environments have got to be more tightly integrated and we've, I've, it's been nice to see some of the discussions that have gone on in the last couple of days where folks are seeing that that issue as well so that's that's about the core infrastructure it's about the software you know greater degrees of abstraction um, working there so we we see that focus and where we're going to help along um, the other piece I would talk a little bit about our specific role going in um, Irene mentioned that the Executive Council meeting met last um, on the 26th of August. And a couple of things that they laid out was the recognition, certainly in Objective 3, which is where I think we are taking a more of a leadership role in the deployment and development side. Obviously, there's a lot that's going to have to come out of that. But recognizing that, the, that there was going to have to be a lot more effort in time to identify areas of potential investment for post, uh, post CMOS, post Moore's Law. Uh, they established a future computing technologies executive council underneath the overarching executive council that is going to be focused solely on um, and picking out where we're going to be investing across these diffuse technology paths with a goal of trying to identify a candidate path or paths um, that we're going to look at, you know, try to identify something in the next three to five years that would give us a viable alternative to CMOS looking again 10, 15 years down the path. You know, for us, it's really important. Um, you know, I think traditionally, when you look at the, the, the long lead time for some of the technologies that we're looking at, um, we, we, we're taking a, 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 I'd say, parallel approach in terms of trying to get the most out of Moore's Law. So the initial focus is going to be on technologies that will extend the classical digital computing architecture and, and, and uh, and framework for as long as we can into the future because we, we hope we can get 10 years out of it, right? While simultaneously trying to identify alternative paths that will help us keep going on that path. Or, and I think realistically what you'll see is that it's not going to necessarily be a one-to-one -one replacement. I don't think we'll ever find something. Certainly right now we don't see anything that will replace classical digital computing um, for a lot of applications, but there may be some specialized places where, whether it's, whether it's neuromorphic, whether it's, you know, ChemBio, um, chemical biological based computing, or quantum computing, where we can kind of take it in a different direction and kind of co and continue that basis. Um, so, and finally, something like that that comes about, it's, you know, certainly that is such, you know, I think Randy mentioned um, because those fields are certainly in the pre-competitive stage for you guys, it doesn't make monetary sense necessarily to invest in those spaces. You, you need the national security or the federal government imperative to drive the investment. But one of the underlying most important aspects of, uh, of the initiative is that if we, we want to be the lead in developing the next thing for, you know, 15 you know, years down the road. So those new architectures, we want to make sure, even though they're being developed for the government, we've got a plan to transition it. So that's uh, the objectives four and five, which is gets a little bit out of sight of NSA's comfort zone in terms of dealing with the public. We don't we don't like to talk, right? But um, uh, they sent me because I can look at your shoes uh, instead of being the, the uh, we, we're notoriously introverted. 
but it's, it's hugely important that we we work with with everyone to facilitate that transition ultimately when it does occur. Um, so, all of those points being, uh, we're. We're supporting the FCT Council. Um, I've actually we stood up a joint program office between the lead agencies, myself, uh, excuse me, myself, DOE, NSF, are going to be kind of the executive coordinators across the interagency for the future computing aspects as we move forward. Um, the, and, and if you read the executive order, one of the things that wasn't necessarily, it was not explicitly noted in the, um, uh, in the EO, but certainly is important in some of the, in the supporting documentation is national security is clearly an application space where we need help. And so we, we've got a, a clear leadership role there because we bridge the gap between DOD and the IC and the data analytics team and we're, we're kind of there. So as that goes along, we're, we're kind of the Johnny on the spot filling in the finger in the dike across the board, I think. And so I, between us, and I think Irene and I are probably going to be the busiest, um, no offense to the DOE guys, they've got, a, they've got the benefit of, I think, some focus. Uh, we're going to be jumping across the boards, I think, but it's looking forward to the challenge. Um, with that, I think um, we can mention key partners, I think, as part of the initiative. There's certainly across the board um, other folks that are going to be taking part in it. We're working with IARPA, with, uh, we mentioned NIST, looking at that future computing space, finding out the technologies that are going to be the most important to invest in. There's a lot of good work that's going on there. And um, we're we're looking forward to um, uh, we're looking forward to where this is going to go. I think some of the language that you had used, or uh, one of the articles we saw, is um, the hopes that this will be an Apollo project for computing for the nation. Um, we we certainly I I, I I hesitate to say that 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 we will put a you know put a man on the moon. Uh, we would like to see that. It's hard to go. It's, we, we recognize that it's hard to kind of grasp the American public's imagination with, with computers, but I think what we're going to look to you guys to help us with is, is capturing that challenge in, in tangible ways that what's the impact of where this is going to go. We want to solve, can you know, I was talking to, to Joseph yesterday, I think that was a great idea, is where we want to be able to solve, can you know, cure cancer, we want to put a man on Mars, we want to do these things. You're not going to be able to do that without a supercomputer uh, and, the next, and take, continue to push the path forward. So, um, I, final, I, I would reiterate my, my last one, that, uh, my last note before I go, and Irene mentioned this a little bit, but we want to put the challenge to you guys, particularly for Objective 5. Uh, as, an, as a former congressional staffer, I'll say I'm, I'm skeptical of, of the federal government coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments about how the best way for the public sector to, um, to contribute. So what? I really feel like there's an uh, uh, implicit leadership role for the community, for the industry and academia to help us find those ways. And we're looking, for the, we're looking for you to tell us how we can help you, whether it's incentivization, direct investments, et cetera. So that's our challenge to you going forward. And um, if there are any questions when we come up, that's all I got. Thank you. active and Uh, NASA, uh, NASA put guys walking around on the on the the, uh, the moon, but beware of encroachment into management uh, by non-technical considerations. And uh, if you are a, a technically uh, active guy, or that's that's a guy in in the genderless uh, sense, um, 
don't uh, be uh, afraid to, to get up into management and, uh, and take your technical skills there. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we agree. Yeah. I would say a part of that, uh, to, to your point, uh, we're certainly, I, I think, view our roles here as trying to be not only the, the, the cat herders and the coordinators, but also the heat shields so that the technical folks can actually deal with that. I, you know, the, the lead agency roles, uh, we're, we're going to be the folks that are going to have to engage with Congress and with the agency leaderships across the board who may not necessarily understand why you have this council at the interagency level recommending potential budgetary impacts, right? Um, so that's, people get very sensitive in that. Um, you, you think we're all on the same team, but uh, that's going to be our biggest challenge. I think the role of the folks that are sitting here, uh, you know, occasionally you need English majors to speak English for the engineers. I say that as a guy coming from NSA where we, uh, we intercept communications, but we don't practice them very well. And so you need those folks. Um, so w your, your point is well taken. Um, a quick question. Joseph George from HP. Um, so 100% agree with uh, the approach, um, you know, find a way for the public to kind of latch on to this as something that's broader than just, uh, you know, a, a bunch of us engineers doing something. I think there's a lot of uh, interest there. My question was around, is there a precedent or something that you can look back to in our history where something like this was done, where public and private work together and if so, you know, what are some of the lessons learned in terms of going forward on that? Let me speak more to what, what we're thinking in, in ECI. And I certainly have had, um, in, in, in a past job, a, a lot of experience trying to understand how we can bring in uh, the public uh, partnerships, public-private partnerships. So in ECI, we're uh, we're taking the management of, of IP and partnership and relationship uh, um, aspects very seriously and have it scoped in, probably not as, as deep and broad as we should. But, um, you know, here, you know, in, at least in the ECI side, we're talking not just vendors for software and hardware, but uh, consumers of HPC, ISVs, uh, users, uh, you know, lots of customers and stakeholders uh, very broadly. I neglected to show... Um, uh, our organizational structure that, that does call for, um, I think, councils and boards that should help here. In this case, an industry council, uh, a science council, board of directors, uh, and there's also some, some DOE and other agency councils. Not that boxology fixes everything, but I think at least we're, we're uh, you know, implementing lessons learned and best practices from, from past projects and programs where this sort of public-private partnership, uh, you know, th these issues were not well, uh, addressed well or, or at all. Um, maybe just a, a quick comment. I, I think um, th there are mechanisms, at least on the NSF side, that have worked. And I would say for Objective 3, which is the Beyond CMOS, uh, you know, my knowledge of other agencies as well as NSF, I think there are existing mechanisms that can either be extended or... Uh, and, and so I think there, uh, there's probably good models. I would say for objective five, given the scale and scope of that, at, at least from the NSF side, I think the activities that we have and the mechanisms we've used are, um, are potential learning, but are, are not going to be sufficient for that. I think I would echo Irene's point there. Um, I, you, we can, uh, there are some great examples uh, for um, good, unique use cases where we've had those public-private partnerships, but I'd say sp particularly for Objective 5, we want to be thoughtful about that because there's a lot of bad precedents that we want to avoid. And I, I'm talking from perspectives from uh, uh, more from the Hill where we've seen trying to set up public-private engagements and you run into quickly um, not just the legal and policy challenges, but quite frankly, um, effectiveness challenges. How, how really effective can you be when you have the government engaged in something? So um, there's, I think what we're looking for is a good balance of government providing infrastructure and, and impetus, and, you know, giving some kind of imperative for the work, but setting up a, uh, a framework for, um, you know, these, these public-private engagements. Uh, one of the things we're, you know, we look at, um, I think for 
HPC, we, we talked about this in the last couple of days, where more and more we'd like to see HPC as a service. I think that has many different meanings to different people, depending on your technical perspective. But you know, the, you've got to, you want to see a market space where pe more and more people are using HPCs, but that requires building up a groundswell of a customer base. And I don't know how we can necessarily help that, except by, um, we, we, we've got to be thoughtful in how we and the federal government can help that. So again, looking to you guys to say, hey, we've had experiences that, that worked, that's great, or this really didn't work, thanks for the help, you know, please try to avoid these past, past models. So, you know, don't be shy. Um, one more thought uh, to bring into the picture, and, and um, that is that it, it, uh, it doesn't just have to be a federal agency to industry. You know, many of the people in this group are representatives from academic institutions, and to the extent that that can be an effective model, that's something where the agencies can actually incent the engagement rather than driving it, and that might have some advantage. So I think it needs to be thought of in that. As far as previous initiatives, I think the closest is the uh, High Performance Computing Act of 1992, I believe it was, so the tail end of the first Bush administration, um, was an act of Congress. Uh, actually, Al Gore was a co-sponsor of the bill, I believe. <laughs> And it actually did in, indeed lead to the transition of the internet from a uh, government-operated enterprise to commercially operated and gave commercial access. It led to the founding of the supercomputing centers and, for example, NCSA and the Mosaic browser. So there is some precedent in which the government has successfully sort of engaged with industry and taken ideas that were uh, more in a research environment and helped transition them into the commercial world. I don't know, just a couple quick ones. I think if you go, my J.O. and AMD, my boss always tells me to say, the views I express are my own, don't represent my company, so. Um, quick one though, if you go way back in history, and I know I'm an old guy, but I wasn't here when it happened. I think if you look at the history around rural electrification and the impact it had over a 20 year period, you've got a good model you can look at for this program today. I'd also point out, I was one of the engineers that uh, was in energized by the Apollo program. Then I went to the dark side and got an MBA, but I'm still technical, sort of. And I think the thing we forget on the Apollo program, and this will lead up to my point, is that as much as it was a scientific endeavor, we were in the middle of a country that was dealing with the issues around a war we were in, and we were in a Cold War. And so I think a lot of people were energized because they could take that effort, putting somebody on the moon, and translate it into a big national initiative that was important. I think the mistake we make in the technology community is we talk a lot about high performance computing. And I don't think people can grok that necessarily, and they understand it. But if you look at some of the big social issues today, I think you know you could probably cross go into even Department of Commerce and look at what are the what are the statistical, the data science work that you could do that would be interesting and exciting to help community development, help deal with the economic divide and those things. I think those are things that you could energize a generation of people that are coming out of school today and they'd understand it. So the comment question, and it's an ill-formed question is, uh, is there a mechanism inside of the computing initiative to look at things like different versions of cloud and whatnot and different ways to make technology available both in the education community and to people that are dealing with challenges at the local level so that they can figure out what sort of question they want to ask and what they want to do with data so they can figure out how to resolve it. So uh, maybe just to respond to that, um, you know, just to, uh, I, I'm sure there are many other examples, but just to pull one up that, uh, that there's currently, uh, it's relatively small at this stage, but um, something around big data called the, uh, the Data Hubs Initiative, which is really starting to form relationships among academic institutions, uh, public sector, and uh, also private sector. So, you know, that might be a learning vehicle uh, that might uh, uh, be a model that could be used at least to inform this kind of an activity. 
Uh, hi, I'm Vince Scarfino. I, my experience is with the auto industry, and uh, I'm interested in, in, there's a lot of reference here to Moore's Law, and uh, there's a couple of ways that people look at Moore's Law. The first one is just counting transistors, and the second one is uh, looking at increased performance. And, and, and the, for the HPC industry, Moore's Law really quit uh, adding performance to this industry about 15 years ago. So I'm wondering to what extent uh, uh, you've got uh, experience to, to see that that's happened and, and, uh, and, and how to apply uh, maybe a different design of architectures in order to get around a problem that's been with us for quite a bit longer than, I mean, you see it in the, in the count coming up with regard to transactional processing, but we've experienced it for the last 15 years. It's the software people that really have brought about improvements. Uh, just get interested in some feedback to what extent you've noticed it also. Well, I think that's very much why the Exascale program is facing some pretty serious technology headwinds. You know, if Moore's Law had continued on a performance perspective the way it had historically, Exascale would be, uh, you know, in the a fairly straightforward transition. And now it's a huge headwind to get the objectives they want in the power budget they're looking for is really, really a hard problem and will require some fairly significant innovation to do that. So yes, I think we understand that the sort of uh, performance part of Moore's Law is already giving us some fairly serious grief. And very much part of this future technology, it's not just we're, we're not going to just sort of uh, stride along all happy as can be and hit a cliff and fall off it or a wall and bang into it. It's going to just be like a slope that will slowly get steeper and steeper and harder and harder to sustain uh, performance gains against that. Yeah, I, I just, just want to add that uh, you know, underpinning the technical basis, we're, we're taking into consideration that you know, single thread performance topped out years ago and, and parallelism is running into it. And I think that's the challenges that, that Randy's talking about. So recognition that in general we're talking general computing power, not just single thread performance. And so there's a whole lot of issues that um, we're looking to things like what you mentioned, the you know, creative finding efficiencies in software and how we approach things to continue the path for as long as we can. Um, and uh, kind of the early stages of the future computing aspect of, more of Objective 3 is to help that on the, potentially on the hardware side, but um, certainly we've taken those into account. Sorry, Irene. Uh, just a quick point with, in, in regard to that. On the DOE lab side, there's been uh, what's known as a co-design activity going on for about five or six years where hardware vendors and software and hardware technologists and applications people work, work intimately together. The idea being that requirements and uh, changes, technology changes flow back and forth. Um, and, and currently, in, in, at least on the DOE Office of Science side, there are three of those centers and I know the NNSA labs are heavily involved in that activity as well. In the ECI project, we see that activity uh, continuing and growing and it's critical uh, because we're looking at some fairly substantial challenges, uh, at least on the application side, the scariest are the, the deep memory hierarchies, probably more so than the, uh, you know, the hybrid uh, floating point accelerators. Um, not that we have a total handle on that, but I think the deep memory hierarchies are, are, are the real concern, which means data structures and, and architecture, uh, holistic architecture changes in your application. So um, not that we solved it, but um, I think we recognize that as a major challenge. We're going to scope this activity in in a, in a much larger way uh, moving forward. So I, <coughs> excuse me. So I sit on the uh, UK government e-infrastructure leadership council, which is a body that was set up to advise the government on HPC, big data, and so on. Um, and that's driven several hundred million dollars of investment over the last two or three years in, that, in the UK. It was set up also in response to concerns of fragmentation in the community between different agencies and different players, um, a lack of strategic vision on behalf of the UK and so on. So set up to address those issues very similar to what you're doing now. However, once it gets to the implementation stage, you then delegate the implementation to individual agencies because there is no single NSCI isn't a thing, it's a coordination between agencies. And even when you're discussing your plans now, you see different 
project approaches and different flavors to it. So the question is, how do you avoid it becoming, reverting back to a series of fragmented initiatives, all using the NSCI label, as each agency pursues its own mission? So um, I, I think we'll probably all want to respond to that, but I, I think um, one needs, uh, th this is a very uh, aggressive program as we've spoken, and there's not one path forward. So I, I think one has to be careful. Uh, one wants a fair amount of innovation at this stage in diversity, so there can be coordination, but I think the issue of having, um, thinking that uh, you just have everyone marching in line on this is wrong too. So the trick is really to balance that. And so, you know, we'll see. So I think that was, you know, the structure of this uh, uh, coordinating committee and governance structure was set up with the intention of trying to keep things together. But that's a huge challenge in the federal government. The budgeting process, which, uh, which congressional oversight committee looks over the different parts of the budget is very agency specific. And so it's very hard to do coordinated efforts within the federal government. And so they, we've attempted to set up an infrastructure. And I think there's certainly very good intentions right now, but keeping that going, keeping it going beyond this current administration and all those are, are certainly challenges we have to be looking after. I think the, the, the challenge for us is gonna be, certainly you've just described what's gonna keep us busy, this, this table busy for the next four years, four or five years at least, um, 10 years for our replacements, I guess. The, the real piece there, and, and what Randy was alluding to, was you had, it was the, the commitment at that executive level of, the, of not only the cabinet level folks, but you've got, um, you know, certainly my bosses, multiple, um, who are committed to seeing through that, and you've got that agreement. So we've been given, uh, the governance structure that was set up with the NSI, NSCI was very elegantly done because we're all mutually, there's some degrees of mutual support there, even for things like, um, uh, you know, there's no one person, there's no one agency that has sole lead on any single objective. There may be greater degrees of, of kind of lead, certainly exascale within DOE, but even there, you know, coordinating budgets across DOE's budget and DOD's budget is something that is, that's, you know, it's challenging, but now we're going to have to start doing that. And so we're going to have to be that mechanism. I, I think the other part, too, is there is an expectation from that senior level, certainly as things evolve, right now, the only thing we have going is the individual agency efforts, but there's an expectation that there's, there's an expectation of synergies and, you know, distinct, discrete, clear, clearly, you know, um, described strategies where, like, we're in, NSA will invest here, DOE will invest here, NSF's going to invest here, and those mutually supporting investments will deliver a combined outcome. And the expectations on the governance side is that as we go along and get, get out of you know, we're kind of debarking from, you know, our known existing budgets. As we go farther along, there's going to be greater degrees of detail that's expected of us in terms of the plan. So, particularly for the future computing side, there's an expectation that that investment strategy is going to be guided by the council. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, credit to the folks who staffed this when they set it up. You know, there's there's certainly going to be continued engagement at the you know, execution level, interagency execution level, but there's, there's commitment at the highest. So we'll, skepticism is, is always a healthy thing to have, uh, but uh, we're, we're reasonably competent, or <laughs> that's Freudian, we're reasonably confident that we can get this going, so. One, one other point, I, I think um, uh, coordination is one form of collaboration it's not like this is ab initio. I mean, this is huge scale and a uh, very big project, but it's not like there isn't other coordination and collaboration going on, some formal, some informal. And frankly, those are extending more and more internationally. Um, you know, I, we didn't talk about that here, but certainly uh, uh, if you look at major projects like the Large Hadron Collider, which is not only um, uh, more and more coordinated across agencies, but also as international. If you look at the uh, large synoptic telescope, I mean, 
it's, it's not as if there is not a foundation um, that's already existing and, and in many cases working well. Uh, I have hope and, and even optimism in the, uh, that the DOE ECI project will be a nexus for cross-agency, interagency, cross-agency uh, collaboration. If you look at um, uh, a lot of the presidential initiatives, uh, most if not all, uh, you know, I can see a, a, a role, this is Doug speaking now, okay, for computing. The Brain Initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, the Clean Manufacturing Initiative, uh, a, lot, a lot of these initiatives aren't in uh, DOE mission uh, space uh, solely, uh, but I see DOE personnel uh, actively involved in these initiatives and, and able to contribute. So in that sense, I think the ECI project, we're, we're, we're planning for these interactions to be uh, formal and, uh, and resourced to the extent we can, because uh, we, we do see uh, um, a, a very interesting uh, value-added cross-agency role here for, for DOE and some of these other initiatives. All right, I'm going to uh, cut off the question and answer part of this particular session. I, I, a couple of things are going to happen right now. First off, I want to thank the, the panel for coming here today. Really appreciate that.